Hello everyone, before we get into today's episode, as always we'd like to thank our executive producers, Tom McCool, Tony Churin, Eustace Abel, and Jeremy Marcoux. If you'd like to help support the show, you can check us out at patreon.com forward slash historiesmost, or send us an email at histories.most at gmail.com for any comments, feedback, or suggestions. Thanks so much, and now, on with the episode. How would you rate a government that overcomes one of the greatest crises a nation has ever faced, that guided a nation out of a worldwide depression as swiftly as could be expected, while other countries floundered, a government whose painful program of cuts could be undone within three or four years, such was the pace of recovery? How would you rate a government which successfully legislated for one of the most complex issues facing it in the teeth of vehement opposition from their own party. A government which cleared slums and built well over a million homes and modernized the countries in many ways that remain relevant today. A government which rearmed the nation and did everything it could do to preserve peace in the face of megalomaniacal dictators, but nevertheless led a united and determined nation to war when the time came, a war that would ultimately end in victory, admittedly under new management, a government that lasted for a decade and won two huge election victories. Would it surprise you to learn that the government that we've been describing is one of the most poorly rated in British history? Let's see if its reputation is deserved. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another very special continuation episode of History's Most. My name is Peter. And I'm Alex, and for those of you that uh, listened to our last episode... It was a bit of a cliffhanger as we ended with a great election victory for the national government. And the question that was begged, I suppose, at the end was what happened next? Well, that's what we're going to delve into today, because we're going to look at British politics in the 30s, which, as we mentioned last time, was really shaped by the 1931 crisis. But today we're going to look at beyond that crisis and what came next and look at a government... Um, or a series of governments that are extremely kind of controversial, much maligned, and really assess why they have that reputation. Do they deserve it? And look at some really interesting policy decisions around economics, appeasement, of course, in the late 30s, all sorts of things. But once again, our guide is going to be uh, Stuart Ball, CBE, um, Emeritus Professor of Modern British History at Leicester University, an expert on the interwar period, author of many books on the subject, including on the Conservative Party and um, amongst other things. So, Stuart, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Alex. So, let's get straight into it. In 1931, uh, the National Government, a coalition of, of Labour figures allied with the Conservative and Liberal parties, won the greatest victory in British electoral history headed by the former Labour leader, Ramsay MacDonald. And yet, um, probably in the vast majority of thing, political history written about the 1930s, about the interwar period, um, this is not seen, the national government that remains in office until 1940, is not seen as a coalition effort really at all. Um, and indeed, MacDonald is viewed almost as a kind of pathetic prisoner type figure, powerless um, in the face of a huge Tory majority. I think the first question we've really got to ask then is, what sort of a government are we dealing with here? Is this a, a coalition? Is this simply a kind of Tory government in disguise? What, what kind of what is the creature we're dealing with today? I think that's that's a very important question, Alex. And the view of the national governments as nothing more than a sham, a, a Tory front, 
McDonald as a, a puppet, glove puppet of, of, of the Conservatives without significant influence, uh, was very much the view that was put forward by the government's critics at the time and subsequently, uh, particularly, of course, by the, the Labour Party in opposition, uh, those people who felt felt very betrayed by what Macdonald had done in uh, forming and joining the national government in, in August 1931, uh, and that, that bitterness of feeling of Macdonald as the betrayer, Macdonald as the traitor, uh, went on for decades and decades and decades throughout the not only the lives of the people involved, but um, you know generations of Labour figures after that. Um, his name is still really anathema within the the uh, the Labour Party that you know um, to the to this day. Uh, but we have to remember that it is very much. The, the view of the government's opponents. It was a view also that was quite dominant for the 30 or so years, 30, 40 years after the Second World War, after 1945, when also the reputation of the national governments was at absolute rock bottom, both for their domestic policy, their economic policy, the, the, the high unemployment, the hungry 30s, um, and also, of course, for uh, their foreign policy uh, of, of appeasement uh, and for e criticism of their efforts at, at rearmament in, in the 1930s. But I think since the 1970s, 1980s, um, as historians have come to take a more balanced view, as more and more both government and uh, private uh, contemporary documents have become available to historians, and, and as perhaps some of the partisanship, some of the, the bitterness has, has, has over time um, lessened, we're getting now a more balanced view of a national government in, in many different ways. So to take first perhaps your uh, question about, is this just um, a Tory front? In one sense, you can look at the parliamentary figures and take the view, well, it must have been, look at how the Conservatives absolutely dominate in Parliament. So to remind you, if we go back to the 1931 general election result in, in October 1931, the national government won 558 seats. And of those, the Conservatives account for 470 MPs. So the Conservatives on their own have an absolutely huge overall parliamentary majority. And you could say, well, they, they could do what they like then, don't they? They don't need their allies um, and, and they don't need to maintain this, you know, national government and, and, and so on. Um, and of course, the Labour Party in opposition was reduced to a very, very small number uh, of MPs in that general election, just, just, just 52. So there's a tiny parliamentary opposition and almost every significant Labour figure um, opposed to the national government uh, lost their parliamentary seat. Uh, though some of them come back and Arthur Henderson does come back fairly, fairly soon in, in a by-election um, in, in, in 1932. My view would be that the national government is not a conservative government in wafer thin disguise for a number of reasons. The main one is that it follows policies in a number of significant areas that are, I think, significantly different from the policies that a purely conservative government would have followed. Um, and that's mainly particularly the case with some of its domestic program, and we'll, we'll come on to that uh, in, in a bit. Um, Baldwin, uh, the leader of the Conservative Party, um, who was the, the, the second 
figure in the national government after obviously Ramsay MacDonald remains as, as prime minister through to the midsummer of 1935, Baldwin takes a, a non-departmental role um, as uh, Lord President of the Council, which enables him partly to, to manage Parliament, uh, manage the House of Commons, and have a kind of wide-ranging brief over, over you know, quite, quite wide areas of, of government policy. He had already committed the Conservative Party back in 1929, um, quite early on in the um, second Labour government, to supporting a bipartisan policy on devolution in India, on, on reform in India. And that's one of the essential things that is holding the national government together. There's agreement and consensus amongst its leading figures on the necessity of preserving this bipartisan policy of proceeding, continuing to proceed with the uh, India reforms. Uh, again, I'm sure we'll come back to this. Um, they're opposed by a significant section of the Conservative Party. And I think it is easier within the framework of the national government for that bipartisan policy to, to continue. And in other respects, I think um, the people at the, the, the time, the leading figures at the time, would have shied away from the word coalition simply because that immediately brings back to mind the peacetime coalition of Lloyd George, and particularly in its declining uh, years of 1921-1922, when it's associated with U-turns, um, lack of principle, sale of honours, uh, a politically corrupt atmosphere and so on. The coalition that the leading figures in the Conservative Party in 1931, the leading figures in the Conservative, uh, Conservatives in the Cabinet in the early 1930s are all the people who rebelled against no overthrew that, that Lloyd George coalition. So I think they probably still regard it um, in some way along the lines of the uh, founding agreement to form the national government back in, in August 1931. It's now less, as was said then, a cooperation of individuals. It's now, it is a cooperation of parties. Um, we would probably call it a coalition, certainly. Um, all of its constituent elements are represented in the cabinet. And indeed, within the cabinet, the conservative share of cabinet offices is a much lower proportion than their share of, of government MPs in the, in the House of Commons. Um, so there are significant uh, number and, and significant offices for the um, liberal, um, was called liberal national and national labor uh, was the name for Ramsay MacDonald's group um, in the cabinet, at junior ministerial level. Um, each of those smaller parties in the national government have their own whips and their own whips office and so on. So in that sense, it, it, it is a coalition with, with all its constituent parts uh, taking a part in the government, and I think having a share of influence over what the government does. Finally, you can't underestimate the significance of the office of prime minister. And although uh, there's a, a lot of, uh, and particularly again in the immediate post-war period, uh, suggestion of MacDonald as uh, a cipher, um, of, of lacking grip, of um, physical and perhaps even sort of, you know, mental health declining. This is really much exaggerated, uh, particularly uh, up till mid late 1934. Uh, MacDonald is in, 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 you know, quite a significant position of influence. Um, he primarily is concentrating on certain areas of government policy. Um, which I think any prime minister has to do. 
but he has a, a, a very significant role as prime minister. One of the things, I don't, I don't know if you'd agree with this reading, but to me, on the issue of MacDonald, um, you know, he had always been most interested in and a specialist in foreign affairs, foreign policy. And that was very much the case in the in the national government from 1931. You know, it's, it's almost dizzying the number of international conferences and visits that he actually did. Um, in the early 30s. To me then, I, I, I would posit that, and I'd be interested to hear your take, that in a way, the way he conducted the national government was actually rather similar to the first two Labour governments in 1924 and 1929 to 31, in that he kind of just let the other departments get on with it. You know, he'd always let Snowden basically run economic policy because he didn't really know much about it equally kind of let Chamberlain run economic policy in the national government. And his own pet project of, of foreign policy, he, he kept keep close tabs on almost up till the end. Do you think that's a fair reading? Yes, I think that is true as far as MacDonald is concerned. Um, as well as foreign policy, the other area that he's very substantially involved with uh, is the, uh, the India question as well. Um, in terms of foreign policy, there are certain areas of foreign policy uh, that he is particularly focusing on. And the most important of these during this period is the quest for uh, further uh, multilateral disarmament agreements, particularly to try and resolve the problems between France and Germany, which are increasingly coming to be seen uh, as destabilizing um, that the very, very harsh punitive provisions of the Versailles Peace Treaty on Germany in terms of uh, what it's allowed in, 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 the, in the way of armed forces and um, the uh, demilitarization of the Rhineland and all these other things compared to what appears to be the, the size and, and strength of uh, French um, army and air force. Um, so that's something that MacDonald is particularly pursuing um, through the League of Nations and through the World Disarmament Conference that is sitting at Geneva uh, on and off for a long period from 1932 to 1934 to, to try and get a resolution. So, yes, a lot of his energy is going into that area. The other thing I think we need to say about MacDonald as well is that MacDonald was very sensitive to his position at the head of this national government, but which had this enormous number of conservative MPs amongst its, its parliamentary base. So he was always very sensitive to anything that might make him look like he was uh, just a puppet of the conservatives and always very uh, keen to uh, emphasize the national nature of the government. Um, and I think that was a, a, a significant element as well. I don't think the Conservative leadership ever wanted to push him into a corner. I don't think there was ever an issue on which they significantly disagreed with MacDonald that would have caused that kind of rift. And I think that's an interesting and important factor uh, when we come to think about why does it carry on as a national government? Why does it why does it continue as that? But they're also aware that if they were to, to, to do so, MacDonald might feel that he couldn't carry on. And they don't want that to happen. I think as well, it's something that as time goes on, the office of prime minister in Britain has become more and more kind of presidential or domineering or like this much more the central figure of all areas of policy um and that mcdonald you know I, I would suggest throughout his career was much more of the kind of chairman type prime minister who oversees um the government but it which which is slightly anachronistic today you know we don't have prime ministers like that who are mere kind of chairmen of the cabinet um, and i think that has actually played against him in the history writing um as well as his um his diary and how 
he feels very sorry for himself and he's very kind of depressed at his split with the Labour Party. But I think personally that that shouldn't affect too much our reading of the political history. The fact that he was a very unhappy man doesn't mean that, you know, that, that he's in irrelevance. Yes, that's true. And um, when we're using primary sources like that, but particularly when we're using diaries, which in this period, perhaps unlike more recent times, really genuinely were diaries written for the person's own particular uh, needs and not ever intended for, for later publication. Um, you have to be very careful not to take them absolutely literally. So just as McDonald's complaints to his diary, um, remember he um, is a, a widower in this period, um, has been for a long time. So the kind of moans that someone might make uh, at the end of a long, tiring, frustrating day, perhaps just to their wife by the fireside, MacDonald, you know, puts those into his diary. And so just in the same way, I think we have to be very careful. I think historians have sometimes fallen into this trap of taking Neville Chamberlain's um, what are called uh, diary letters. This is a, a lengthy letter that he would normally write every Sunday to um, his, his two unmarried sisters who, who, who live together um, and their lengthy, lengthy accounts uh, in which it appears that the only person in the government who has any ideas and is capable of doing anything is Neville Chamberlain. And well, yes, he was a very powerful figure. He, he was very effective in many ways, but we can get easily carried away to seeing the national governments through the eyes of Neville Chamberlain's letters to his sisters and seeing Macdonald just through the lens of, of, of his diary. So we have to take a, a wider view. And as always with any historical topic, the wider variety of perspectives, the wider range of, of, of sources, primary sources, particularly contemporary sources that you can bring into play the, the more rounded view you're, you're going to get. And that, of course, is, is, is what has been happening since the, the, the 1970s, um, since at the, at the end of the 1960s, when the, the change from um, a 50 year closure on the public records to a 30 year closure suddenly opened up the interwar public records at a stroke at the end of the 1960s. And then since then, more and more of the, the political figures, private letters, private diaries, correspondence um, has become available to historians. And so we don't have this kind of black and white, or indeed one might say black and black and black view of the national governments for 1930s. We have a much more nuanced, a much more rounded view now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I would, one final thing as well, it, it, talking about wider perspectives than just what someone's confiding in a personal diary or these personal family letters, you know, people would have viewed, um, particularly on the international stage, you know, people like MacDonald were very highly respected and very influential figures. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's too often forgotten. I think biographers also have the tendency to think about the person a lot. And of course, that's what the point of a biography is. But um, I think that sometimes has led to a slightly kind of jaundiced view. I think Let's... that's, that's if I could just say, I think that's absolutely right as regards to McDonald's international reputation. Um, and, and if you remember, uh, Alex, from our previous discussion of the 1931 crisis, that was the very reason why the king was so keen to persuade McDonald to stay on as prime minister in, in 1931. It's often forgotten that Ramsay MacDonald was the first serving prime minister to visit the United States back in 1929. He has a considerable transatlantic influence and, and a considerable influence in Europe, a long connection with the League of Nations. Um, and so in that sense, he does bring weight to the government and is an asset to the government. I think the other thing we ought to mention is well, keep in mind about Ramsay MacDonald is that 
again, the parliamentary figures can mislead us. Yes, in the 1931 election, there are only 13 MPs elected in McDonald's own national Labour group. But the Conservatives, certainly the Conservative leadership and most Conservative MPs, were in no doubt that McDonald had been worth a lot of votes to the national government throughout all those other constituencies that didn't uh, have a, a follower of McDonald himself standing, uh, or rather they did, but it was a conservative or, 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 or a liberal. So in that big vote that the national government received, that big popular vote that the national government received, 14.6 um, million votes in, in 1931, unprecedented figure there was a significant number of those votes who had been swayed by MacDonald, who had been swayed by what they would have seen as his sense of duty, his patriotism, sacrificing his career for the sake of the nation, to his, his broad appeal. Not the bedrock, of course, of, of, of Labour voters, but quite possibly quite a lot of people who might have voted Labour for the first time in 1929, probably, and we can only say probably because we have no opinion polling in this period, so we have to go on the impressions of people at the time, uh, anecdotal evidence. Um, but it's clear, I think, that MacDonald was, uh, certainly in 1931, and very possibly still in 1935, to a lesser extent, but certainly in the general election of 1931, MacDonald's position in the, in the national government as prime minister of the national government was a significant element in, in people voting for it and brought with it a substantial number of votes. It would be guesswork as to how many they would be, but I would be surprised if they were less than a million, could be two million. Yes, I mean, the number of safe, quote unquote, Labour seats that turn conservative in this yes. election you know, just wouldn't have happened if it wasn't a, a national kind of combination with McDonald's. Yeah, a, 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 it's a, it's a cross-party appeal. It, it's a, the national government's appeal is one that crosses party boundaries, is wider as a whole than the constituent parties within it. And I think that's a key factor and is a key factor in why the national government keeps together, why the Conservative Party wants to keep it together and there's I, I recently read a study of, of the kind of grassroots of the um national government the conservative party essentially um by Geraint thomas oh yes. and yeah. um there was polling data or canvassing data door-to-door -door canvassing in leeds west which was a very you know northern very working class constituency held by a conservative mp and the obviously they had how many households said their mm -hmm. allegiance for each party, and the highest one was National Labour. Even though you know National Labour wasn't a significant force, it didn't have an MP there. Mm -hmm. It was an awful lot of working class people who identified with the national government rather than necessarily identified as conservatives, um, which I think is a kind of overlooked aspect again of, of this government. Yes, I think that's right. And, and we've got bits of evidence from like that. That's a very interesting example. Uh, there's some other canvassing records um, that happen to have survived because these things are ephemeral. You know, they, they don't normally get kept for, for decades and decades afterwards. Their, their survival is often an accident. Um, but we do have one or two other examples. I've come across some later in the 1930s um, in a Scottish constituency. Um, an extensive house-to-house -house canvassing survey, which um, uh, local political parties did a great deal of that in this period. It's just generally it, it doesn't survive. But um, it's not until we get very close to the Second World War that we get any kind of national opinion polling in Britain. And even then, it's fairly basic stuff. Um, the, the Gallup organization starts doing some opinion polling in about sort of 1937, um, 38, 39. And 
we'd have to be a little cautious even in using those figures because they, they didn't have the sophisticated methodology that, that pollsters have nowadays in terms of, you know, what's, what's their sample, their, you know, the social and economic basis of their sample and, and, and so on. Let's then get into the detail of this government um, in terms of its policy. Um, and of course, it was elected on a doctor's mandate, a mandate to fix the economy you know, in whatever way they could, because, of course, that was the overwhelming concern of voters in 1931. Um, and one of the main issues we talked about last time with regards to the election was tariffs, this age old, it seems, question in British politics of free trade versus tariffs. And very quickly, actually, the national government uses its blank check mandate to start implementing a system of tariffs. Um, can you tell us a bit about that, Stuart? Yes, the issue of protectionism was the major one in the national government during the first year of its existence, from September 1931 to September 1932. And it was the most divisive issue within the national government during its whole uh, existence from, from 1931 right through to, to the Second World War. It's the one issue on which there is a significant uh, disagreement of, of principle and policy uh, within the cabinet and between the uh, different parties which make up the national government. So on the one hand, uh, the Conservative Party, as you may remember, when the national government was formed, the thing that the Conservatives were most afraid of, were most concerned about, was that their ability to finally get a popular mandate to move away from Britain's traditional free trade uh, uh, system to introduce protectionism, to introduce tariffs, they were concerned that they might get knocked off course by this, by, by participating in the national government. Um, and the agreement on which it was formed was had various elements in it to, to try and reassure them, to try and guarantee that. So when it comes to the 1931 general election, uh, conservative candidates under the overall umbrella of the national government saying that it's simply asking for public confidence. It's simply asking for a doctor's mandate to do whatever it, 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 it deems necessary uh, after the election to resolve the crisis. Conservative candidates are absolutely clear with their electors that it is essential to tackle Britain's economic problems that protectionism be introduced. So they do have a mandate for that they do have overwhelming numbers in the House of Commons. It is certain that protection is going to be introduced. The stumbling block is an element of the Liberal Party in the national government. That uh, part of the Liberal Party um, is now led by Sir Herbert Samuel, um, in August 1931, he had been the deputy leader of the Liberal Party to Lloyd George, who at that time had been uh, convalescing from an operation. Um, but Lloyd George broke with support for the national government at the time of the 1931 general election and separated himself and uh, the two or three MPs uh, of what was known as his, his family group, uh, mostly related to him. Um, have, to, have separated themselves from, from the Liberal Party. So Sir Herbert Samuel is now the leader of the Liberal Party. He's the Home Secretary uh, in the Cabinet formed after the 1931 general election. And he is still uh, strongly committed to free trade, as is Philip Snowden, um, who moves from the Treasury after the 1931 election into a non-departmental uh, post, but still within the cabinet, still a very significant figure. And his place at the Treasury is taken by Neville Chamberlain, the son of Joseph Chamberlain, who first raised the standard for tariff reform back in 1903. It's uh, 
not only a recognition of Chamberlain's position as the number two figure within the Conservative Party, a person of increasing authority uh, and known effectiveness as an administrator, but also as someone personally uh, and from his family history uh, committed to, to protectionism. So after the general election, this is going to be the critical issue. Um, in February 1932, the government introduces what's called the emergency tariff. This is um, uh, tariff measures designed primarily to raise revenue to, to balance the budget, rather than being particularly targeted for the protection of certain specific industries or, or sectors. Uh, it's, it's a revenue tariff. But it's only possible to do this after a rather remarkable constitutional innovation. Um, we had perhaps a kind of innovation in the 1931 general election uh, with the, the doctor's mandate, um, but this is a much more uh, uh, specific one. Normally, the doctrine, as far as the cabinet is concerned, is one of collective responsibility. All members of cabinet have to publicly support the cabinet policy um, at all times and vote for it in the House of Commons. This, of course, is what brought down the second Labour government in August 1931, that a very large minority of the cabinet could not agree to the policy and therefore must, must resign in order, to, in order to oppose it. What happens in February 1932 is a unique setting aside of cabinet collective responsibility. It's called the agreement to differ. And under this, on this one issue, on this one area of policy, introduction of, uh, of, of tariffs, ministers in the government, cabinet ministers and junior ministers, are at liberty to not only speak against it in the House of Commons, but even vote against it in the House of Commons. Now, it's a concession that the Conservatives, in a sense, can easily give, because with 470 Conservative MPs, um, there's no doubt which way the vote is going to go. Uh, but it's a device which enables the national government to stay together. Macdonald wants it to stay together. If the free trade liberals, which is not all the liberals now, but if the free trade liberals and Sir Herbert Samuel were pushed out of the government, essentially forced out over the tariff issue, Macdonald makes it clear that then really it would have lost its credibility as a national government. He, he, he feels he would have to, to, to resign or certainly he would, he would consider his, his position as the phrase goes. Um, Samuel doesn't want to break up the national government either, uh, but he feels obliged um, to, to support the Liberals' traditional position of free trade. So they get over this crisis, they get over this first hump in the road in February 1932 with this innovation of uh, the agreement to differ and the government doesn't have to break up and people don't have to resign from it. Um, and they can still oppose, um, ineffectively oppose, but they can still oppose the introduction of, of, of the revenue tariff, the emergency tariff. And then of course, this first bump in the road is negotiated with seeming ease. Mm. Um, and I suppose, like you say, because that allowed they're kind of just a voice in the wind against this massive Tory majority, then it's quite easy to give that concession. Um, but the Liberals, uh, or at least the, the free trade Liberals, do make a stand just a few months later because um, the long-held dream of the protectionists is an imperial system of tariffs that the the dominions of you know Canada, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, there'll be a trade system between them that excludes the rest of the world. 
that's the issue that the free traders just cannot abide. Yes, the next stage in uh, the tariff story is the Imperial Conference. Um, for the first time, not held in London, but held at Ottawa, uh, the Canadian capital, in July and August 1932, with the aim of drawing up uh, a reciprocal tariff system with the self-governing dominions under which uh, they will get uh, lower or zero tariffs on the goods that uh, they export to uh, the British market and in return British exports will get uh, a reduced uh, or zero uh, tariff rate on uh, exports uh, from the UK to, to the Dominions. Uh, and this has been at the heart of the tariff policy for the Conservatives ever since Joseph Chamberlain first raised the issue in 1903. It was always uh, about much more than just protecting uh, British industries from the effects of uh, more efficient uh, or, or subsidised uh, overseas competition. Um, that, of course, was an, an important element, uh, particularly with the problems of British industries in the 1920s and 1930s, simple, straightforward domestic protectionism. But the part of the policy that had always been the idealistic part of it had always had the, the greatest emotional appeal to conservatives and explains their, their loyalty and commitment to this policy over several decades since 1903, despite election defeats on it several times, is this idea of binding the empire more closely together, more effectively together, first as an economic unit, and then perhaps also leading on from that as, as a political unit. So a very powerful uh, cabinet delegation goes to the Ottawa Imperial Conference. It's led by Stanley Baldwin. Um, Ramsay MacDonald remains um, in the UK, or indeed partly actually uh, in, uh, in Geneva during this period, uh, engaged with the League of Nations and the, the, the World Disarmament Conference. Um, but a, a substantial, powerful British government cabinet delegation goes to Ottawa, led by Baldwin, including Neville Chamberlain, including uh, key figures of um, the National Labour and, and Liberal figures in the government as well. Uh, they succeed in uh, hammering out an agreement with the, the Dominions, uh, not without its difficulties, as the Dominion Prime Ministers are, are naturally uh, careful of um, the concerns of their own uh, domestic industries, but uh, an agreement is arrived at. And when this is presented to the Cabinet on the delegation's return from, from Ottawa in September 1932, the introduction of a full-scale protectionist system with a full-scale imperial preference system is not something that the strong free traders in the cabinet can agree to. And so Philip Snowden resigns. He's the only one of the Labour Former, former Labour figures in the national government to do so over this issue, but he was a very significant figure in the government's formation. And a section of the Liberal Party um, that is led by Sir Herbert Samuel also resigned their ministerial offices. It's important to say, by the way, that this section of the Liberal Party does not at this point withdraw from the national government. They remain supporting the national government. They remain sitting on the government side, on the government benches uh, in the House of Commons for another year before they do formally go into opposition. So it's a slow stage process, the withdrawal of the liberal part, the liberals um, who look to Sir Herbert Samuel as their leader. This is the section of the Liberal Party that goes fully into opposition to the national government before the 1935 general election and which continues on and is the direct ancestor of the present day Liberal Democrats. <laughs> 
but the other portion of the Liberals in the national government, whose leader is Sir John Simon, and I'm afraid this is one of those cases where the names get a bit confusing, um, Sir Herbert Samuel, who'd been the Home Secretary in the government, uh, is a figure who resigns over free trade and his followers, the Samuelite Liberals. Um, Sir John Simon, who is the Foreign Secretary from 1931 to 1935, is the leader of the group of Liberals who, even before the fall of the Labour government in August 1931, had come to accept uh, the need for the introduction of tariffs, had, had, had moved away from free trade and had been negotiating a, a electoral pact with the Conservative Party um, before the national government was formed. So in the 1931 general election, there were 36 Liberals elected as followers of Sir Herbert Samuel and 35 who were followers of Sir John Simon. So it's very evenly balanced. So it's only about half of the liberal supporters of the national government who uh, partially withdraw, go into this sort of semi withdrawal from the national government in September 1932. And the crucial thing is that with the Simonite liberals who become known, they're known as the liberal nationals, remaining in the government, several of them in very prominent cabinet positions. Sir John Simon, Foreign Secretary, as I've said, Walter Runciman, President of the Board of Trade, key economic position, a number of others as well. And with the other figures, former Labour figures, apart from Snowden remaining in the government, but Donald remains as Prime Minister, J.H. Thomas, Lord Sankey remains as Lord Chancellor and so on. It is still very credible that this is a national government, that this is not just a conservative front, especially, as we've said, as the Samuel Liberals don't immediately go into opposition to the government. Um, they don't do that for, for, for another year. It's an interesting point, that, actually, because I'd never really considered the fact that, um, obviously, Herbert Samuel and his followers are all become you know, that they continue on as the official Liberal Party. And so this defection is seen as, you know, the Liberals leaving the coalition. But actually, mm -hmm. it's much more of a 50-50 split at the time in the Liberal yes. Party. And it's more some Liberals. Because they're, mm. without wanting to get into too much detail about the Liberal Party particularly, but it is a very strange organisation, which means that these two groups are not really separate parties. Um that's but, right. And, and yeah. the, the, there's even um, some movement between them. There's <clears throat> definite blurring at the edges. I mean, when I gave those those concrete figures for the number of followers of, of Simon and the number of followers of Samuel, <clears throat> there are a few people who it's a little bit difficult to decide exactly which side of that line they fall on. It only becomes really clear when the um, Samuelite liberals do actually formally leave the national government and uh, resign the national government whip um, and cross to the opposition benches in the House of Commons. But even after that, there are sometimes MPs who move both ways. There are, uh, not, not in large numbers, but there are examples of liberal national followers of Sir John Simon, who decide to cross and join the, the independent Liberal Party. Um, and there are one or two who move the other way and, and support the national government. So it's, it's a pretty confused picture. But I think the key point is um, to suggest that because of the resignation of Snowden and the withdrawal of Samuel's section of the Liberal Party from the national government, it suddenly ceases to be um, a cross-party government. It suddenly is uh, just a, a, a Tory front. I, I think that's very much over-reading this, reading much too much into it. 
Let's look then at another central aspect of kind of um, economic and domestic policy. And it's something that the national government indirectly is, is very much known for, which is that the 1930s are known as the hungry 30s. I think you mentioned that. It's obviously the decade of the Great Depression. The popular image is of one of, you know, long-term suffering and hardship. And I wanted to really ask, really to try and get to the, the, the truth of that image, the facts behind it. What is the national government's record on the economy, on unemployment, on the standard of living? You know, how does the depression pan out in Britain, basically? That's a really, really significant area, Alex. And it's one on which um, historical views have developed significantly uh, over the, the decades since the Second World War. But both on this area of domestic policy and also on, on the national government's defence and foreign policy, I think it's fair to say that the, the general public perception is still very much that very, very negative one that was established, established even during the Second World War. Uh, and in the decades, in the decades after it, um, and so certainly, uh, as we've said before, uh, from 1945 for three, four decades after that, um, the the record of a national government uh, in this area was uh, very, very heavily criticised. One of the things that's changed that view. Um, to be a, a, one might say a less simplistic one, a less black and white one, is that since the late 1970s, we've had a number of other recessions, a number of other depressions, which haven't been any easier to deal with. And there's especially, I think, a problem that's, that's perhaps more, more recognized now, that if there's a, a world depression, it's very difficult for one country to significantly buck that trend on its own, that what it's within the power of one country to do, even, even a country with a significantly large economy uh, in world terms, which is uh, certainly the case for Britain in, in the interwar period, um, you are still to some extent swept along by the currents of, 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 of what is happening in, in, in the world economy. So what happens as far as the national government is concerned is um, things get worse before they slowly start to get better. Uh, and this is really the, the, the impact of the world depression. And if you look at, at what is happening in the United States economy, uh, and indeed, to some extent, as well in, in various European economies, it, it, it's all part of the same pattern. So uh, unemployment continues to rise after the, the national government is, is formed. Um, it uh, is an average of 2.8 million in 1932. And it peaks at just under... 3 million in January of 1933. This is the measurable unemployment, of course, of, of, uh, of, of, of insured workers. Um, but these, these are the only definite figures that we can go on. Um, there may well be a, a wider element of, of, of unemployment than that. And that's the sort of issue that economic historians has certainly debate. But as far as the official figures on, on the number of the, the insured workforce who are, who are unemployed. So it peaks at 2.97 million in January 1933. And then the unemployment figures slowly, slowly come down. Uh, the 1933 average is 2.58 million. The 1934 average is 2.58 2 million and the 1935 average is, is, is 2.1 million. By the time the next general election takes place in um, late 1935, 
the number of unemployed has for the first time fallen, fallen just below uh, the, the, the two million figure. So in that sense, the government can show that things are improving, that things are slowly turning round. Um, in other respects, um, of course, there's a long debate, uh, has been a long debate about the economic policy of the national government. How effective was it? What, what were the alternatives? Were there really alternatives, realistic alternatives? We talked about this also when we talked about the um, financial crisis in, in, in August 1931. The problem, again, is you have to take the confidence of business, the confidence of uh, finance, uh, and not only within Britain, but elsewhere um, with you in, 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 in the measures that you're taking, if they're going to have any effect. So yes, the government does follow what at the time is regarded as the correct approach, the orthodox approach, to dealing with the depression, um, reducing government uh, expenditure, um, and that includes the reduction in the unemploy unemployment benefit um, rate uh, uh, and the introduction of what was very unpopular, the what was called the means test. Um, this refers to the fact that national insurances we've said before, uh, was an insurance scheme. Uh, workers, when they were in work, paid in a, a certain amount of money every week, topped up with a contribution from their employer and a contribution from the state. So they got a greater benefit than just the amount that was deducted from, from their own wages. Uh, and that you, you, you paid into the um, national insurance scheme while you were in work, and that entitled you to certain benefits when you were out of work due to uh, unavailability of work or due to sickness or, or, or whatever. But it was not unlimited. Um, and it depended, your, your uh, entitlement depended on how, how long you'd um, been contributing to the scheme, but, but it, it had a definite limit, even if you've been contributing to the scheme for many, for many, many years. So what happened when you ran out of your unemployment benefit is that you then went on to what was called public assistance. Now this was administered locally by local authorities and it was a lower level of benefit than the one paid by, by national insurance. And it's that benefit that was means tested uh, in terms of the household income. So, for example, if you had a household where the, the head of the household was out of work, but two adult sons or daughters who were living in, living in that same household were in employment and were bringing in wages, then that was taken into account in, in, in the assessment of the public assistance benefit that was, that was paid. But again, I think it's important that we emphasize that in Britain in the 1930s, there was this safety net. Um, there were the insured benefits. And when those ran out, there was the public assistance as well. It's not generous. It's, it's certainly not comfortable. Without doubt, there was privation and, and hardship, and I wouldn't want for a moment to suggest that that was not the case. But people who were out of work were enabled to carry on living in the accommodation they were in and to afford the necessities of life and sometimes maybe even a, a little more than that. You see, for example, uh, cinema attendance in the 1930s is rising and rising and cinema attendance numbers, even uh, in uh, perhaps understandably, actually, uh, in the most depressed areas uh, are still very substantial. Um, a cinema ticket didn't cost you 
very much in 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 that period. Um, so the situation was certainly not as bad or as difficult uh, as many people found in other countries, um, uh, particularly uh, the, the the United States. Um, some of the other things that the government did um, to try and uh, tackle the economic situation, stability of the exchange rate and the position of the pound was very, very important. And obviously that had been the issue that had brought down the second Labour government, the issue that the national government had been, had been formed around. So at first, as you may remember from our previous discussion, in September 1931, the national government was forced to abandon the gold standard. Actually turned out to be a helpful thing. And uh, the pound after going off the gold standard for the next few months um, floats on the exchange rate and it devalues by about 25%. It goes down from the, the gold standard rate of um, $4.8 uh, uh, to the pound, goes down to, to 3.6 um, for a number of months. But over the next couple of years, the pound actually recovers. It, it, it doesn't return to the gold standard, but its exchange rate recovers. And actually by 1934, the exchange rate of the pound with the dollar is just over $5 to the pound, five, five dollars and, and, and four cents. And one of the reasons for that is a measure that Neville Chamberlain introduces in his budget in April 1932, which is the creation of a thing called the exchange equalization account. I won't get into the technicalities of it because I'm sure I don't properly understand them myself. I'm not enough of an economic historian to do so. But effectively what it did was it, uh, the, the Bank of England uh, was able to um, operate to, to buy and sell sterling in a way to keep a stable exchange rate. Um, and this had a number of benefits. It meant that uh, speculation um, on the currency wasn't really worthwhile. So that helped to keep things stable as well, uh, avoid the kind of runs on the pound that, that had, had been such a problem in, 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 in 1931. Um, so we've got exchange rate stability restored um, from onwards. Another thing which Neville Chamberlain does in 1932, he gets a lot of the tough stuff over in the early part of the national government. Um, and that's to tackle the problem of the national debt. And the national debt, of course, had become enormous as a result of the First World War. And the huge amount of money that the government had borrowed, uh, the war loans in the First World War, the interest rate on, on this was at 5%, and it was a, a, an enormous amount of, of um, the government expenditure every year on servicing the national debt. What Neville Chamberlain did was uh, a programme of, again, I won't go into the technicalities, but uh, a programme of converting the war loan to a lower interest rate of 3.5%. And that enormously reduced the annual cost of servicing the national debt as far as the, the government's budget was concerned. By 1938, the cost of servicing the national debt had been reduced by nearly half compared to, to, to 1932. The other thing which also finally um, was of great help in tackling the economic problems of the 1930s was the lowering of interest rates the lowering of the bank rate, which uh, as now basically determines the interest rates that um, are, are generally charged. From June 1932, uh, the Bank of England standard uh, bank rate was reduced to 
Now, I know nowadays uh, with our current rates of, of, of interest and, and, and as they have been, you know, since the, the uh, 2008, nine financial crash um, are extremely low and well below that. Uh, and that's partly as a consequence of one of the lessons of the 1930s um, that, that that policy has been followed. Uh, but in this period, um, this was a significantly lower interest rate than had been the case before. And what it means is it's cheap money. It enables people to borrow money for investment and especially to borrow money for house building and to borrow money for mortgages to buy the houses that are being built. And so these three things ease the pressure on the government's budget. They restore uh, business community and financial uh, domestic and overseas confidence uh, in the government's handling of the economy, which again, that makes the, the government itself more stable. Uh, so it's almost like a, um, a circle, um, what's it called? The opposite a of a vicious circle, a yeah. circle. Yes. No, the, the opposite, no, no, the opposite, the yeah. virtuous circle, where a good, you know, a benefit leads to another benefit, leads, you know, cycles around to, 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 to another benefit as well. Um, so the result of this is that by 1934, in his 1934 budget, Neville Chamberlain is able to restore the unemployment benefit cut and half of the pay cuts for uh, government uh, employees, uh, civil servants, the armed services, um, teachers and so on, uh, and to cut income tax back to the level that it was in, 19, in 1931. Uh, and in 1935, uh, Neville Chamberlain is able to restore the rest of the, uh, the, 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 the pay cuts uh, as well. So there's, in a sense, good things, at least, well, more than on the horizon as far as the economy is concerned. By 1935, we've got increasing prosperity especially in the Midlands of England and the South, but concentrated depressed areas, particularly where the old staple industries are concentrated, South Wales, parts of Lancashire and, and Yorkshire, coal fields, uh, steel, um, the northeast with the, the, the coal mining areas of Durham and Northumberland, the shipbuilding areas of Tyneside and Sunderland and Hartlepool and things like that. So these industries re re remain depressed uh, until right at the end of the 1930s, the increasing rearmament programs start to start to have an effect on them. But we've got a different picture. If we if we look at um, well, quite large parts of the country, uh, not just the Midlands and the South, but uh, in many, many towns and cities, um, we have new industries developing, uh, production of, uh, of vehicles, cars, cars and lorries. Uh, by the outbreak of war in 1939, we're at a position where we've got, yes, still one million unemployed, but also one million private cars registered. Um, and, you know, that's a pretty significant widespread um, ownership of, 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 of cars in, in, in this period. So you can see that prosperity uh, coming in. Um, so yes, the, these new industries uh, in newer kinds of cleaner factories trading estates um, distributed around the, you know, um, new industries around the, the, the edges of, of towns, um, electrical engineering, chemicals, rubber, um, a, a whole, whole range of these, um, manufacturing things like some of the new domestic appliances, the Hoover, uh, the typewriter, 
uh, uh, and things of, of this sort. And we've got that housing boom that I mentioned. Um, between 1935 and 1939, 1 1.6 million new houses are built. If you think of all those interwar semi, semi-detached around the edges of just about every town and every city in Britain are built during this period. Um, so it's a massive housing boom, a very considerable expansion also in um, house ownership uh, through, through mortgages, through building societies. And the thing about housing building, it's very labor intensive. Um, so a housing boom like this employs uh, a lot of people directly, um, a lot of trades and skills are involved, and it has uh, an effect on, um, on other industries around it, on, on those that, that, that supply it. Uh, so by the time we get to the later 1930s, the combination of the housing boom and the rearmament programs are, are very clearly pulling the country out of recession. Um, the, the worst of it really is from, from, from 1931, you might perhaps reasonably say from, from 19, 1930 through to 1934. And after that, we have these, um, what is called at the time, unemployment black spots or, or depressed areas. And the government does try to tackle these um, through a policy, a regional policy. Um, the Special Areas Act of 1934 that tries to provide forms of assistance and they're limited assistance, uh, but to um, the, 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 the still remaining depressed regions. So the idea that the government did nothing, um, was indifferent, is, is definitely completely wrong. Um, some of the things that it did are those things in the background um to do with the economy and the government's budget um and some of the other things are, are more direct government policies in, and we'll come on to some of those in some of the other areas of of, of 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 domestic policy yeah i mean i think it's you know it's not an area of my specialism either economics but um it's clear that certainly britain you know was better off and had a better standard of living by the late 30s than in the kind of late 20s so if you're taking the long view i suppose you know that is that is progress um now one area of of government policy that was very controversial at the time and actually took up an awful lot of the national government's time in in the first few years and yet it's probably forgotten today was the highly controversial government of india act which we mentioned actually at the start this was an attempt um, to begin the process of giving self-governance in india um, but it was opposed by a very significant portion of the conservative party not least um, or maybe fair to say led by uh, winston churchill so the Government of India Act, Stuart, mm. like I say, it's not really because independence is only a decade later or so. Um, it's not really seen as, as something that I'd say is, is headline grabbing today from a historical point of view. But it probably was one of the most important things the first um, term of the national government was contending with. I've read something by Rab Butler on, on Stanley Baldwin saying that it was his, his greatest achievement. Um, and the conservative opposition was, was really massive. It was, I also, I think it was Nick Smart who pointed out that it's, it's a bigger rebellion than Norway, which brings down Chamberlain in 1940. So this is a very, very serious issue. Is this a fantastic achievement? Is this something that only a national government could have done? Or is it kind of rightly in the dustbin of history, so to speak? No, I think we might say that the Government of India Act was unlucky to be 
consigned to the dustbin of history, yes, but because of the impact of the Second World War. If there hadn't been war, if there had been time for the system that it established to fully come into effect and start working, uh, and possibly for the Congress party in India to decide to take advantage of the opportunities that it offered, which were very substantial um, to, uh, uh, to work within it, then it, it might have been at least a significant development um, and a much longer delay to a process of complete British withdrawal from India and, and Indian independence. And that of course is what it was designed to, to, to do. The Government of India Act was not designed to lead to India leaving the British Empire. Uh, it was not designed to lead to Indian independence. It was designed or intended to be a further step along the road to India becoming a dominion, self-governing dominion, similar to Canada and Australia within the overall framework of the British Empire. That's what it was, that was what was the aim of the people who uh, advocated it. And, and many within the Conservative Party were strong supporters of the Government of India Act because the only alternative was an absolute refusal to make any concessions to what uh, Indian politicians, Indian political parties were asking for, uh, to stop the process that had already been begun after the First World War, to go back on promises that previous British governments had made and rely on simple repression and coercion. One of the great problems that the opponents of the Government of India Act had, um, as you say, with Churchill very prominent amongst them, was that they didn't really have a credible alternative policy. Their policy was simply, no, don't do this, don't do anything, even perhaps try and turn the clock back a bit. And it's not really realistic. It, it might have an emotional appeal to people like retired army colonels with experience of India from decades before, people like Winston Churchill, whose opinion, whose experience of India, very brief experience of India in the 1890s on the Northwest frontier, which is hardly typical of India, as a young cavalry officer, um, one of the things that Baldwin said of Churchill over this issue in the 1930s is he's still the young subaltern of Hussars of 1895. His, his views hadn't developed. Well, in the 40 years between 1895 and 1935, India had changed enormously. Uh, and the political nature of India and the development of, of uh, politics in India had, had changed very profoundly. Um, the impact of the First World War had been very considerable and so on. One of the significant uh, factors in support for the Government of India Act and of it passing was that nearly all of the currently serving and recently, um, recently retired from serving governors of Indian provinces supported it. And many of these were people who had been middle ranking conservative ministers, whips or respected long serving backbench MPs um, who had then been appointed to be, you know, governor of Madras or governor of Bengal or whatever, um, and who had personal experience of it. Uh, and almost all of the figures, particularly from a Conservative Party background, who had recent experience of India, supported the passage of the of the Government of India Act. And it was such a long and difficult, you know, I think it was something like three year battle in Parliament to get this through in the face of, of what they were called the, the diehards, the, the kind of Tory right or um, the right wing element of the Tory party. Um, is that a battle, do you think, that uh, if it was just a purely conservative government, 
um, rather than a national government. Do you think that's a battle that um, the, a, a conservative government would have fought for so long and so hard, or, or do you think they would have that it had to be a national government to get it done? I think it's difficult to say that it had to be a national government to get it done because before the national government is formed, well before the national government is formed, uh, Baldwin and the other leading figures in the Conservative Party have all committed themselves to support this policy. Um, actually, it's an even longer process than, 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 than even the, the one you, you mentioned. Um, it goes back to the late 1920s and the Viceroy of India, who was appointed by Baldwin when Baldwin was Prime Minister in 1925, uh, who's Edward Wood, uh, Cabinet Minister, who's probably better known to us later in the 1930s as Lord Halifax, uh, when he succeeds to uh, his father's peerage, um, better known to us as the Foreign Secretary under Neville Chamberlain and the possible alternative to Winston Churchill as Prime Minister in May 1940. Uh, but from 1926 uh, to 1931, he was Viceroy of India. Um, his father was still alive, uh, so he was given a peerage in, in his own right um, as Lord Irwin. And that was his title as Viceroy of India and, and through until uh, the death of his father in 1932, when, when he became then also Viscount, Viscount Halifax. And in the early months of the second Labour government, um, he agreed with, with the government and agreed with Baldwin as leader of the opposition, what became known as the Irwin Declaration. Uh, in the autumn of 1929. And that's really what kicks off the, the India issue within the Conservative Party. Because the Irwin Declaration was a commitment, a uh, public statement on the part of the British government that was, was made by Irwin as Viceroy in India, that it was the aim of British policy for India to evolve to dominion status. And when that came up for debate in the House of Commons uh, a few weeks later, and Baldwin backed um, Lord Irwin, uh, it led to the first part, start, the start of the India revolt. Um, and it's also the issue which Winston Churchill resigned from the shadow cabinet over in January 1931. So yes, it was, it was a long, long stage process from the Irwin Declaration in autumn of 1929. Uh, there was then held what was called the Round Table Conference, uh, which was a conference in London, but with representation and delegations from Indian uh, political opinions, uh, uh, Indian uh, political parties. Um, eventually, three Round Table Conferences that were held. Uh, between late 1930 and, and, and 1932 to arrive at, uh, uh, at proposals. And then um, in the spring of 1933, the national government brings forward a white paper uh, of its proposals. Um, and this is referred to a joint select committee of both houses of parliament to examine, take evidence, extensive taking of evidence. Um, and that doesn't report for 18 months until November, 1934. And its proposals are the basis then of the Government of India Act that's brought in and proceeds slowly through parliament from the end of 1934 to June, 1935. The revolt of the diehards, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, until Brexit, uh, 
this is the largest parliamentary revolt of conservative MPs uh, against their own leaders and their government. Um, at its highest level uh, in some of the votes uh, in uh, 1934, 1935, it's about nearly 80, nearly 80 MPs. But of course, out of the 470 conservative MPs in the national government, that, that's still a very small, very small minority. The key battle actually isn't in parliament. The key battle is even the, within the Conservative Party organization, the, the, the grassroots organization of the Conservative Party, the, the party membership. Um, and here it's a much closer, much closer battle. So there are a number of votes on resolutions about India at the Conservative Party annual conferences of this period and at the meetings of what is called the Central Council. Um, that's a body, a representative body of uh, all the um, constituencies in the country. It doesn't have quite as many delegates as the full annual conference that's held only once a year, but it meets more often and it still has a very, very large membership. Um, uh, ne nearly a thousand uh, people uh, could attend if, if, if all the delegates did attend. And numbers are generally smaller than that. And there are a couple of occasions when the votes are very, very tight. Um, at the point where the white paper is introduced, in fact, just before the white paper is introduced, it's probably a height of anxiety. What are the proposals going to be? How much is going to be given away to the demands of the more extreme elements uh, of, of as, it, as it's seen from Britain, of Indian opinion, such as Gandhi, such as the, the, the Congress party. Um, there's a vote in February 1933 at the Central Council, um, that the government only narrowly wins by 189 votes to 165, with significantly 151 abstentions. Um, and it's those undecided conservative supporters uh, that Baldwin successfully persuades to the, to the government view over the next couple of years. But again, in, in March 1934, uh, another uh, resolution at the, the um, Central Council meeting on that on that date, uh, the government wins by 419 to 314. It's it's a better margin, but in a larger vote. Um, and at the annual conference in October 1934, probably the closest run thing, um, a resolution critical of uh, the government's policy. Uh, brought forward by uh, the diehards uh, is amended to a decision that the party organization should not pass any further resolutions until after the joint select committee reports that they shouldn't prejudge the issue that they're not the experts um, and, and they shouldn't be trying to tie the hands of the government before the Joint Select Committee's report. So it's a, it's a good kind of neutral way of saying, you know, kicking it into the long run for a period of time. But even so, um, that is only passed by 543 votes in favour to 520 against. And that's on a ballot. That's taken to, to a secret ballot of, of the delegates to the party conference. So within the party organization, within the conservative rank and file, it's a much closer balance, a much more difficult thing. Uh, and I think it's a mistake to focus too much on, on the parliamentary revolts. Um, the opponents of the India Act and Churchill, them, and Churchill amongst them were absolutely clear from, from early 1933 onwards that the only way to defeat this was for it to be rejected uh, for the leadership to be rejected by the party organization by the rank and file and certainly that would have that would have had to entail Baldwin's resignation uh, as, as, as party leader the idea that the conservative party organization and the conservative party annual conference has no power and no influence is is completely wrong 
um, Baldwin could not have, could not with any possible credibility have, it's not that there was a mechanism like nowadays where a Conservative Party leader could be removed on a vote of MPs. No, that doesn't exist in this period. But his position would have been untenable if the core policy to which he had absolutely committed all of his authority and prestige was rejected by the representative organisation of the Conservative constituencies. Now, of course, one reason why they don't reject it is the party rank and file's confidence in Baldwin, um, pop the popularity of Baldwin, but also the respect in which he's held and the recognition that it would smash up the national government. And the related suspicion that some of the opponents of the India Act, particularly Churchill, that's what they're primarily after, that they're using it as a tool to try and smash up the national government for their own personal ambitions. Yeah, uh, wouldn't have been the first time that people decided to pursue quite a radical agenda for their own personal ambitions. But anyway, <laughs> um, let's. we've talked a bit there about Baldwin's leadership um, and his, his high standing in the party, and you'd probably say in the country as well. And, and there's no better embodiment of that than what happens in 1935. Um, MacDonald resigns um, as prime minister in the summer of that year. Basically, his health is, is fading. It's, it's time for him to go. And Baldwin becomes prime minister. Not, in the, not, not that long afterwards, he goes to the country, wins a pretty strong election um, victory. The question I want to ask here is, why do they stick with the national government label? This is not... This is a Conservative Party leader becoming Prime Minister, but he decides to become Prime Minister to remain in a national government, even though by 35, as we've said, that the economic problems have largely been addressed. The budget's been balanced, the cuts have been restored, the economy's on the up. So it's no longer an emergency government. Why then do the leaders of the Conservative Party feel it necessary to keep their allies with them to keep the national brand? I think as always, we've got a range of factors here, um, all of which are pushing in the same direction uh, of making, continuing the national government the best uh, and most attractive option available. Um, so one factor certainly is there's nothing now really dividing the national government, no issue of, of policy, either um, economic policy or social policy uh, or external policy, the empire or, or foreign policy, on which there is significant disagreement within the national government, particularly significant disagreement between parties in the national government. So, I mean, we do get later in the 1930s, Anthony Eden, Conservative Foreign Secretary, resigning because of a dispute with the Conservative Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, over the direction of foreign policy. But that's not uh, a, a dispute on party lines within, within the national government. So it's become an arrangement that he's working and he's working well. Uh, people have uh, got used to their colleagues, comfortable with their colleagues uh, within, within the national government. So I think that's part of it. The other thing as well is, is it's always easy with benefit of hindsight to look back and say, well, yes, the national government was in a very comfortable position. Yes, the economy is improving. Uh, unemployment is coming down, although it's still very high. Uh, yes, there are signs of, of, of economic brightening in certainly parts of the country, it doesn't mean it's so clearly obvious to people at the time, either those in uh, high offices in government or to, to public opinion. And the national government actually had gone through a really rocky patch of um, 
confidence in itself uh, in the early months of 1935. Uh, it was a combination of things. It was the height of the battle in the House of Commons over the passing of the Government of India Act um, and, and the parliamentary revolts against that. Now, th they're never at a level that might break the government up, but they're putting considerable strain on it and considerable strain on the position of, of, uh, the con of Baldwin and the Conservative leaders. What coincides with this is a crisis as a result of a reform of the government's unemployment policy. Um, this was uh, an attempt, it begins earlier, it, it goes back to 1932, 1933, to make consistent over the whole country those uh, levels of public assistance payments, the, the payments to people who've run out of their national insurance unemployment benefits and who have gone on to local public assistance. And there's quite wide variations in the rates that local authorities are, are, are paying. Um, and that also involves, to some extent, uh, pressure on national government finances as well. Uh, so what we would nowadays call a quango is set up by an act of parliament. It basically, it's an attempt to take this out of politics, to make it a, an administrative matter uh, overseen by an administrative body at arm's length from, from, from party politics. So uh, a body is set up called the Unemployment Assistance Board, the UAB. Um, and the former uh, Conservative uh, Minister of Labour in, in the national government, um, Harry Betterton resigns from being Minister of Labour, is given a peerage and appointed to be in charge of this, this, uh, this body. And in early 1935, it attempts to introduce universal national new rates of public assistance. And obviously, of course, as they're trying to equalise things and at the same time economise on expenditure, the standard rate is that's being imposed is towards the lower end of the variety of payments that were previously being made. And that means there are quite a lot of people who are losers and that starts a very significant agitation in their constituencies. And many of these are constituencies with national government MPs. Remember, there's only um, a little over 50, uh, a bit more now because the Labour Party's won some by-elections, particularly uh, from 1933 onwards, won quite a few by-elections, which is, which is worrying for the government. Um, but still, you know, the large majority of constituencies in the country have national government MPs. And so the combination of some concerns about the economic situation, um, the problems in Parliament with the Government of India Act, and a big uh, crisis that blows up about the uh, UAB's new um, benefit rates, all combine in, in, in a shock to the government in early 1935. And then together with that, as I've said, you've got worrying signs in by-elections um, of substantial Labour wins um, in seats, mainly ones that had had a Labour MP in, in, in 1929, but there are a few of these. So the government can't feel confident, and certainly if it was to break up, it certainly couldn't feel confident of how that would be, how that would be received by the public. Most of all, I think, is the fact that public confidence and economic confidence is still heavily invested in the idea of a national government that is cross-party, that is, in a sense, almost bipartisan. Um, and there's nothing to be gained by, by breaking it up. Um, and a great deal that could be put in peril. So I suppose in summary, what one would say is, as far as most Conservatives are concerned, there are, there are a few who dislike it as a coalition, um, certainly on the right wing who think that it's been pursuing semi-socialist policies in, in various areas, 
um, and, and want to go back to, you know, the pure, true blue conservatism, but they're, they really are a small and, and not very influential minority. Um, and for most conservatives feel reassured by the existence of a national government, and now under a conservative prime minister, that certainly helps, but that it will continue to follow pretty much the same, very centrist, very moderate, reformist, but not too radical policies, that it will oversee continuing economic recovery, which is by no means guaranteed. Things could take a nosedive again. So there are all sorts of reasons, political, economic reasons, for keeping the national government together. Nothing really to be gained by the Conservatives dispensing with it. And remember that those national government figures, other than the Conservatives, although they may not be very large numbers in terms of members of Parliament, very possibly do still, Macdonald still, uh, carry an appeal to a wide section of, you might say, middle of the road opinion, people who are not strongly committed to one political party or the other, exactly the people whose votes you need to win marginal seats. Yeah, it's almost throughout the national government period, or particularly the first half of the 30s, the numbers are kind of irrelevant because they've got such a big majority. Mm. It's more about the kind of political weight so to speak of the actual figures themselves um you know the politicians now another area the national government legislated in was social policy and i, I believe they're kind of quite um i don't know what's the right phrase progressive in this area in a way that a purely conservative government might not have been yes i think that's right and i think it's a very important part of uh, understanding that this isn't just a disguised conservative government. Um, some of the things that the national government does uh, are certainly policies that a moderate centrist conservative government, the kind of government that Baldwin had led from 1924 to 1929 uh, would probably have done, um, but others perhaps not. Um, and in that respect, the national government follows a very middle of the road, very centrist uh, policy in important areas of uh, social policy and domestic policy. So if I give a, a few examples of this, um, one of the problems that Britain is facing in the interwar period is very severe depression in agriculture, uh, really from uh, the early 1920s onwards, farming in Britain is very, very hard hit, is in, severe, is in severe depression. In the early 1930s, the national government engages in a level of state intervention, uh, unlike any previous governments. And, and one of the hallmarks of the national government actually is that it does do things in the way of state intervention, uh, which, you certainly would not expect necessary from a conservative government or even of, of, of previous governments. In some sense, you could say that they are pragmatic responses to some of the very severe uh, economic and social problems that the country is facing. But even so, um, they are really quite striking and they have long-term significance uh, in quite a few cases. So to give some examples of what I mean here, um, in 1933, the government brings in the Agricultural Marketing Act, uh, which provides powers that if a particular sector of agriculture uh, comes together um, and in agreement, it can set up a marketing board to market its products. So you think of the milk marketing board, the egg marketing board, these all go back to this period. And that if, if they do so, in response to the industry organizing, in a sense, 
in response to the sector of agriculture taking steps to help itself, taking positive uh, steps to become more efficient, more effective, uh, to market its products in a more efficient way. The government will impose import controls on competing imports. So this really is a major step towards improvement in the state of British agriculture uh, in the 1930s. And it applies by the end of the 1930s to quite large parts of, of British domestic agriculture. Uh, there are marketing boards, uh, as we said, for milk and eggs and bacon and various other products. Uh, there are quotas, import quotas for competing um, cereal crops like oats and, and, and barley and, and, and so on. Then another major area is housing. Um, and this does build on developments in the 1920s, both of the first Labour government and of the Conservative government of 1924 to 29. But major measures of slum clearance in the big cities. So there's a Housing Act in 1933 that enables much more um, demolition of slum houses, much more uh, condemnation of, of, of properties that are unfit for habitation. It, it does result in some grassroots conservative um, uh, reaction to that, because quite often um, in this period, um, middle class people, uh, as, as an investment would own a, a, a few terraced houses um, uh, to, to rent out. And often, uh, particularly as they were hard hit by depression, the depression and rising taxes, often couldn't afford to actually maintain them properly and were finding that their houses were being condemned for demolition without compensation. So in some cities like Leeds and, and, and on Glasgow and some other places, there's some grassroots conservative hostility to this in 1934-35. In but broadly speaking, the 1933 Housing Act leads to major um, slum clearance programs and enables very substantial local authority housing developments, big council estates being built in this period. I mentioned before um, the Special Areas Act of 1934, in which the government intervenes with special powers to help the, the most depressed regions uh, in the country as well, to encourage uh, investment, and that's extended in 1937. The Road Traffic Act in 1934 is the first one to introduce speed limits. A 30 mile an hour speed limit in urban areas is from the Road Traffic Act of 1934. It introduces uh, compulsory driving tests as well as speed limits. It introduces the safe crossings for pedestrians with those orange flashing beacons who are known by the name of the Simonite Liberal National Minister of Transport who saw the bill through. Leslie Hoare Belisha, the Belisha Beacon on our traditional zebra crossing. The London Passenger Transport Board in 1933 is another major measure of government intervention um, as well. And this continues in the later national government, uh, just to pick out a, a, a few things. In 1936, the Midwives Act creates a national salaried midwives service. It's a major measure of health reform leading on towards the National Health Service after the Second World War, but it's the national government in 1936 that creates a salaried national midwife service, the service, of course, of the popular TV series Call the Midwife. Um, and same year, 1936, national insurance is extended to agricultural workers, never included by Lloyd George in the original scheme because their seasonal nature of their work made it too expensive but national insurance is extended now to cover almost every category of worker by the end of the 1930s. And in 1938, the government introduces compulsory holidays with pay. Employers right. being required, <laughs> employers being required, before that you could have a holiday, but you didn't get any pay. You, you got paid when you worked, you didn't get paid when you didn't work. But now the idea that you would actually be paid for a week on which you would you know, off to Blackpool or South End or wherever it might be. So some quite significant reforms during this period. Uh, a significant, a significant, the last one I'll mention, 
um, could have been a quite significant education act in 1936 that would have partially raised the school leaving age, but its implementation date um, is overtaken by the outbreak of war. Uh, and then it's replaced by the 19, the famous 1990, uh, me, the famous 1944 Rab Butler Education Act that is the basis of the post-war education system. But there are a lot of significant forms. There are many other smaller minor measures one could mention as well. The national government through the 1930s is continuously legislating for all sorts of reforms, many of them maybe not very glamorous, but still making an improvement in some area of uh, national life or the economy or, or, or whatever. So the idea that it was a government that didn't care and did nothing doesn't stand up to any close scrutiny. And it kind of chimes with what the national government always said of itself, particularly after the immediate 1931 crisis, which was that it was governing in a non-party, non-ideological, scientific manner, as, as it was a kind of a uh, bit of a buzzword in the 1930s, being, you know, scientific, being rational with your politics instead of doctrinal. Absolutely, absolutely. One thing I did want to ask, this is, you know, the final part of Baldwin's very long career. You know, he's prime minister for a third time between 1935 and 37. Um, he, you know, I think pretty much all historians would praise his handling of the abdication crisis in 1936 when Edward VIII leaves the throne. We'll not get into the details of that because I think that's a very well-trodden story. Um, what, how would you, though, assess that final stage of, it, of his career, that last few years of his premiership? Because there is a probably a very strongly one influenced by, as we've said before, Chamberlain's own private letters and things like that. The idea that he's old, he's deaf, you know, he, he mm. doesn't really do very much. He sits around, uh, much the frustration of the heir apparent <laughs> Chamberlain. Um, what do you make of it? Should he have, have done another term? You're absolutely right, of course. Frustrated heirs apparent um, who are waiting to take over and, and uh, becoming critical of, of, of uh, the delay and, and, and their predecessor is by no means an unusual thing in, 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 in British politics. I think there are problems with Baldwin's final term as prime minister. Um, it's just all, almost exactly two years um, he, he exchanges offices within the cabinet with Ramsay MacDonald uh, in late June 1935 after the uh, Silver Jubilee of King George V. Um, MacDonald becomes Lord President of the Council, Baldwin's previous post, and Baldwin uh, takes over the Premiership. It's a very smooth transition. There's relatively limited uh, reshuffle within the government. Probably the most significant thing is the move of Sir John Simon from being foreign secretary, where he was generally regarded as having been not very successful, particularly through to really kind of indecisiveness, um, to being uh, home secretary. Um, and the promotion uh, to being Foreign Secretary of Sir Samuel Hoare, who had had the incredibly tough job of being Secretary of State for India from 1931 to 1935 and handling the, the India issue and the long, long uh, uh, battles and, and the long, long running of the Joint Select Committee and, 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 and all the rest of it, um, and the successful fruition of that and the Government of India Act passing in June 1935 and uh, Hoare become, becomes Foreign Secretary. But otherwise the government is not, is not very greatly changed and of course Neville Chamberlain continues as Chancellor of the Exchequer as he has been since uh, 1931. Baldwin's successes in this period, certainly leading the government into uh, a successful general election campaign, partly able to um, benefit from disunity in the Labour Party uh, in October of 1935 
disagreements within the Labour Party over its attitude to foreign and defence policy, um, the uh, pacifism, uh, the personal uh, pacifism of the Labour uh, Party leader, uh, George Lansbury, leads to him being effectively forced to resign in, in October of, of 1935 before the election um, and is succeeded in a caretaker role by his deputy, uh, Clement Attlee. And this is how Attlee becomes leader of the Labour Party before other major Labour figures get back into Parliament at the 1935 general, general election. Uh, so when the election comes, Baldwin's um, appeal to the public is very much on the basis of what the government has achieved, uh, but also of continuing in, uh, as we've said, in the same um, uncontroversial, uncontroversial way. Uh, and he's very, he's very effective at, at that. Uh, and the result is, is really very successful. I mean, it's, it's the second biggest landslide in, in British political history. I think I'm right in saying that. After that of 1931, um, the national government uh, wins 429 seats. Um, it wins over 50% of the votes cast, which again is an extremely rare thing. Even, even when parties win big landslides, they don't normally win over 50%. Um, the national government won 53.3% of the votes cast in the 1935 election. And those 429 national government MPs are made up of 387 conservatives and, and most of the losses are conservatives. Uh, there are still 33 uh, liberal national followers of, of, of Sir John Simon and there are still eight MPs in the national Labour group. Ramsay MacDonald is defeated in his coal mining seat on uh, Seam uh, in Durham. Um, really not surprising. Um, but uh, it returns after a by election for, 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 for another constituency. The Labour Party improves, but only to 154 MPs. Uh, but it, its vote rises. Um, it runs 552 candidates. Um, its vote rises to 8.3 million, uh, a 38.0 share of the, of the vote. So the Labour Party is clearly recovering its position as the opposition, but it's a long way behind. It's a long way behind. 420, 429 national government MPs, 154 Labour MPs. Very shortly after the election, there's a major blow to the prestige of the national government and, and, and to Baldwin's prestige, which is the promises given in the election of its foreign policy um, being supportive of the League of Nations seems to have been um, misleading, to say the least. Uh, as a result of the revelations of what was known as the Hoare Laval Plan. And this was an attempt by the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Samuel Hoare, and the French Foreign Minister, Pierre Laval, who, meeting in Paris to try and come up with some sort of deal that the Italian dictator Mussolini would accept in order to call off his invasion of Abyssinia, his invasion of Ethiopia. Uh, and it involves, of course, making substantial concessions to Mussolini, making con substantial concessions to Mussolini's aggression, um, which is in violation of the, the, the League of Nations. Um, Abyssinia is a member of the League, so it's an attack by one member of the League, Italy, on another, uh, seen as an unprovoked aggression but it's an attempt to try and avoid a larger scale conflict, to avoid Britain being drawn into a, possibly a Mediterranean war and to preserve some kind of independent, independent Abyssinia. It's leaked to the press before it even is uh, able to be put to, uh, to Mussolini and there's outrage. 
and the government has to repudiate Hoare and say that he's exceeded his authority and what the cabinet had agreed. This is a very murky area. It's a very murky area as to whether or not um, the, the proposals that, that in the Hall of Our Plan um, are or are not, you know, those that, 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 that the cabinet would have, would have accepted. But the political storm is such that um, Hoar has to resign as, as, as foreign secretary. Uh, and to restore public confidence in the national government, the uh, second cabinet minister for the Foreign Office, who has specific responsibility for the League of Nations Affairs, and who is a bright, young, glamorous figure, a former officer, of a decorated junior officer from the Western Front, closely associated with support for the League of Nations, is promoted to be Foreign Secretary. And that is how Anthony Eden becomes Foreign Secretary at the end of 1935. Now, going back to Baldwin, which was, of course, what you were asking about, for the rest of the period, that's been a substantial knock to the government and, and to some extent, to his own uh, confidence and, and, and position. Through 1936, the government kind of gets back on course. Uh, it proceeds with various measures, some quite significant measures of social policy. And we will perhaps come, come, come back to what some of these are. Um, and Baldwin has always been a prime minister who was largely content to let departmental ministers run their departments without him leaning over their shoulder and poking his finger in everywhere, rather unlike Neville Chamberlain. Um, and thinking that he knows better what they should be doing uh, or, or the legislation that they, they bring forward. So he has always been more of a chairman of uh, uh, the cabinet in, in, in that respect. In the summer of 1936, Baldwin does have uh, a bit of a collapse of health, um, a bit of a nervous breakdown. He, he did have something similar, actually, in his premiership of 1924 to 1929, um, not perhaps quite as bad, but a period of ill health. It's basically strain and stress, um, work and long hours in the, in the House of Commons and long hours of endless meetings and just getting getting worn down. Um, so he is advised for his health to, to take a break for a bit and, 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 and convalesce. And um, as he comes out of that is where he's then confronted later in, towards the end of the year with the um, the abdication crisis, which, as you say, it, it is generally felt both at the time, very substantially at the time, and, and generally since, he handled as well as it could possibly be be handled uh, with the with you know the least damage, the least uh, div div divisiveness, and and probably with benefit of hindsight, the the the, the best outcome for for the country. Once, the, once over the abdication, the actual abdication itself in December 1936, Baldwin takes the decision that he had more or less been coming to anyway, um, that he would stand down, he would retire after the coronation of the new king. Obviously, the, the abdication, um, to some extent, uh, you know, affects that timetable, um, but he, he holds that to that resolve, so he's really acting in a mainly kind of caretaker way during the first uh, five months or so of, of 1937. And then in the immediate wake of the coronation, uh, at the beginning of June in 1937, he stands down and makes way for Neville Chamberlain, who really is the undisputed um, and long uh, apparent uh, uh, successor. Well, and Neville Chamberlain is a figure who is um, invariably kind of tied to foreign policy and specifically to appeasement and the road to the Second World War. And that's really the area of policy that I suppose dominates the second half of the 30s. I mean, I'll just run through briefly with, mm. you know, you've got the Italian invasion of Abyssinia that we've mentioned in 1935-36. Spanish Civil War from the summer of 1936 um, 
all the way through to 1939. Um, you've got the Japanese uh, invasion of, of China, the Japanese, um, Japanese Sino War in 1937. You've got the Anschluss of Austria um, by the Germans in 1938, followed by the Czech crisis and the Munich Agreement the autumn of the same year. And then uh, the events of 1939, which lead to war. So really, it's like a nonstop um, chain of uh, huge um, foreign policy events. I haven't even mentioned the reoccupation of the Rhineland. Um, so I, I don't want to, again, get into the weeds of these individual events because I think they're quite well documented. You know, the story of things like Munich are, are quite well known. What I want to more take is the kind of holistic view of the whole Britain's rearmament, appeasement um, process in the second half of the decade. Um, because it's, it's been massively criticised and, um, you know, from as early as 1940, the politicians like Chamberlain and Baldwin were labelled as the guilty men who let... Britain slip into into war in a disadvantageous position. So it's quite hard to work out an angle of approach here, but I think what I would ask would be, why did the national government pursue the foreign policy it did? I think that's a big enough question to start with. The answer to it answers both why it pursued the foreign policy that it did and why and when it pursued the rearmament policy that it did as well. And it primarily comes back to two things. Most importantly, public opinion. And secondly, and this is particularly in the area of rearmament, um, the economic situation. But the defence policy, the, the rearmament policy and the foreign policy are absolutely inextricably bound up together. You can't have a more assertive foreign policy if your defence situation is perilously weak. If you have a very strong uh, def defence situation, you can be perhaps more interventionist uh, or at least um, more active in, in your foreign policy. So there's always the aspect in, in, throughout this period of a very, very, very directly harnessed together um, issues of what can be done in foreign policy and, 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 and you know, what is happening in, in, in defence policy as well. So to take the, 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 the two main factors that I mentioned, the overwhelming one is public opinion. And um, the crucial thing here, it's hard for us to imagine the tremendous impact of the First World War on public opinion in the 1920s and 1930s. There had never been anything like the First World War before, in its scale, in its loss of life, in the material damage that it did, in the horrendous conditions of, of the, the, the Western Front. Um, and reaction against this, uh, first of all, uh, represented in the belief that that must be the war to end wars. Um, we must never go back to another conflict like that again and hence all the faith that's invested in institutions like the League of Nations. So there's tremendous public opinion pressure on the national government to work through the League of Nations uh, to try and make the League of Nations work which is becoming increasingly difficult in the 1930s as major powers leave it um, and other major uh, well, obviously, most of all the United States had never even joined it in the first place. 
um, but the idea of collective security <clears throat> through the League of Nations is still hugely powerful. The, the, those are the, the promises um, that the government had made in the 1935 uh, election, uh, uh, you know, are very much a, a, a part of that. So, along with that, is the pressure for disarmament the belief that a major contributory cause of the First World War had been the competing armaments races between the various powers, like the, the naval race between uh, Britain and Germany, but also just the huge buildup of armaments of the, of, of, of the European great powers. So again, through the interwar period, you have uh, tremendous public uh, uh, pressure for disarmament, not rearmament, and it's going to be very, very hard to turn that around. Um, and, and Baldwin does that very effectively in the 1935 general election. He, he does secure uh, um, a mandate uh, for uh, um, rearmament. Um, he calls it repairing the gaps in our defences. You know, what could sound less threatening? What could sound less like launching, you know, into the, the danger of involvement in another terrible European war? Um, so as far as, as, as the public opinion is concerned, um, the British government is at one with British public opinion right through the 1930s of trying to resolve these conflicts peacefully which is what appeasement is meant to be. It's meant to be acting to tackle justifiable grievances. And it's felt that Germany in particular has justifiable grievances. Now that the, the Treaty of Versailles is years in the past, why should Germany continue to suffer these humiliations, these incredibly restrictive provisions um, where other powers are not disarmed down to Germany's level? Um, you know, Germany appears to be, you know, have much more powerful for, for neighbours. Um, so appeasement was intended to be a policy to defuse conflict, to address conflict peacefully, to, to arrive at negotiated solutions um, and avoid uh, the, the dangers of another war. And it, it's massively supported by, by, by British public opinion right through to the outbreak of war. And in one sense, one could say as well that by the time we, we do get to September 1939 and Britain having to declare war uh, after the German invasion of Poland, you have a British public opinion that despite its massive reluctance to be involved in another huge war with Germany has come to accept that everything possible had been done to try and avoid it. Um, that you have a, a united public, that united public opinion that Churchill builds on uh, in the summer of 1940 after the fall of France. Um, that, that in a sense that Britain has done everything it could to, to avoid war. Maybe has gone too far. Maybe has gone the extra mile. But it does mean that Britain appears to the rest of the world as having tried everything to avoid war, not as an aggressor, not as a militaristic power, uh, and also to British public opinion across the political across the political spectrum. So that that that's very very important indeed. And then there's the economic situation. The economy is very fragile, um, so avoiding war but also trying to avoid the need for huge expensive armaments programs. They're not only something that would alarm the public, greatly alarm the public as being on the slippery slope on the road to war, but they're regarded um, in economic terms as a completely wasteful expenditure. You spend all this money on all these tanks and planes and guns and so on to pile them up and hopefully never use them. Um, a, a big rearmament program is going to put strains on 
uh, government finances, it's going to have to involve greater borrowing, it's going to have to involve perhaps higher taxation, it's going to be very expensive, it's going to be unproductive. Now, in fact, the other side of the rearmament programme, as we've said earlier, is it starts to increase the demand for things like iron and steel and shipbuilding. The Royal Navy starts after a long, long period of disarmament. The, nav the naval disarmament agreements of, of Washington in 1922, the London Naval Disarmament Agreement in 1930, and even the much more limited one of 1935, have basically stopped um, shipbuilding for the Royal Navy very largely through, through, through a long period, certainly as far as building any, any really big ships like battleships and aircraft carriers are concerned, that now starts to be resumed in, in the later 1930s. So it does start to actually bring work and employment back to some of these depressed industry areas. But there are very, very good economic reasons for trying to, um, certainly to avoid war, to, to try and get a peaceful resolution of, um, of problems and public opinion is enormously behind that. It also shapes the rearmament that is followed. It, it shapes the foreign policy the government does. It shapes the rearmament that is followed. It's really important to understand that what people in the 1930s were expecting, particularly public opinion were expecting, but also many of the, def the, the defense planners as, as well, was the usual thing, the next war, will be like the last war, but more so bigger and worse. So what public opinion is expecting the next war to be will be attritional misery of trench warfare, you know, the Western Front even worse and, and the terrible war of attrition. And on top of it, massive aerial bombardment of civilian towns and cities with casualty figure projections that read to us more like you'd expect if a nuclear bomb was dropped on London rather than just what the Luftwaffe could actually do in 1939 or 1940. And chemical weapons and gas attacks. The reason why every man, woman and child in the United Kingdom carries a gas mask around with them from, 19, from the outbreak of war to, to the surrender of Germany. So they're expecting the next conflict. It's not like 1914. You know, this is going to be mainly fought by a professional army and over by Christmas. Nobody thinks that in the 1930s. They expect a worse Western Front, massive civilian casualties from bombing and chemical weapons and, and, and all the rest of it. And understandably, are willing to do almost anything to avoid that kind of horror. What's interesting there, actually, is that I read recently Harold Nicholson's book, Why Britain is at War, that he wrote right at the start of the war, designed to explain to the public why the Britain is at war. And he kind of made the point you just made about, well, we've done everything we can to kind of keep peace. And I, I kind of read that almost, you know, with my 21st century as like a kind of pretty pathetic excuse for appeasement of, oh, well, we did our best. Um but actually, that's a really interesting point of, of the public wouldn't have accepted a war or wouldn't have got behind the war effort in the way they did in the Second World War, were it not for the fact that it was very patently clear to them that there was no other option. So would you kind of, without wanting to stray too far into counterfactual, say that, look, because of public opinion, because of the economy, because of the rearmament having to be as late as it was, Britain couldn't realistically have fought a war before it did? I think that's probably true. Um, I think what has happened with historical views of, of the national government's appeasement policy and rearmament policy, um, the pendulum has swung very much from the original view during the Second World War and through at least to the 1960s, 1970s, the, the, the guilty men view. Um, these were, you know, weak, deluded uh, fools and, and uh, it was a naive, you know, policy and self-delusion and, 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 and so on. 
Um, and then in the, from the mid 1960s onwards, you got the start of a revisionist school, particularly uh, um, in terms of uh, foreign policy, um, bringing in all these factors. Well, you know, as you say, what else realistically could be done? I think there's a slight danger almost now, perhaps the pendulum swung a little too far in the sense of, yes, one can find many understandable good reasons for the policies that the national government did follow, uh, both in regard to particularly Germany uh, and in regard to rearmament. But I don't think it's a hundred percent letting them off the hook of could better policies have been followed at certain points? Well, with the benefit of hindsight, yes, possibly. Could more have been done in terms of rearmament? Well, it's always possible to do more. Of course, it's always possible to do more. Um, not so much perhaps rearmament starting any earlier than it did, because it does start fairly, fairly early on. It, rearmament actually starts as a result of the crisis in the Far East um, of Japanese expansionism into Northern China, uh, the Manchuria crisis in 1931 to particularly 1933, when the Japanese start to take over uh, Northern Manchuria, um, Northern China set up a, a, a puppet state there. Um, it's this which leads to the beginning of, of rearmament in 1934. In October 1933, uh, the cabinet, this is really pretty early on, I mean you have to bear in mind at, at this point, October 1933, Hitler has been Chancellor in Germany for a matter of a few weeks, barely, barely months, with no indication that he's going to survive long in that office or position. He may be swept away as quickly as he was swept into that office by the economic and political currents and turmoil in Germany. There's, there's no indication that he's going to be there for any, any length of time or, or what indeed he's, he's intending to do. And he makes all sorts of contradictory statements. So October 1933, um, the cabinet establishes um, a body called the Defence Requirements Committee, the DRC, and that's to look into where Britain needs to um, strengthen its defence position uh, to begin rearmament. That reports in February 1934, and it results in a fairly substantial um, Pro, beginning of a programme of rearmament, fairly substantial one. And the really significant thing about it, the really telling thing about it, is the proposals that the DRC brings to the cabinet are for an expansion of the air force, uh, some uh, resumption of, of shipbuilding for the Royal Navy, uh, completing the Singapore naval base, because remember this results from Far Eastern crisis initially, that has been kind of frozen for on economic grounds for, for many years, uh, resume the programme of building the, the base at Singapore for a British fleet to operate in, in, in the Far East, and a uh, force of uh, for the army uh, of five divisions that um, could uh, go overseas. Very significantly, the use of the word expeditionary force is explicitly avoided. Memories of the British Expeditionary Force of 1914. It's to be called the field force and no suggestion that even so, when that program comes to the cabinet, it's revised to increase the air force expansion from the proposed 52 squadrons that the DRC proposed to 84 squadrons and to slash the spending on the army by half. Air defense against that attack of bombers on British cities, it's a defensive measure. It's not an offensive measure 
it's not a commitment to get involved in a land war on the, on the continent of Europe. And that pattern more or less continues with the rearmament program through and, and, and certainly until 1939. Events lead to it being regularly increased and expanded always right through to 1939. The largest amount of money goes to the Air Force and a lesser amount, of, second amount of money to the Navy. And the army is, is, is Cinderella at, at, at the back of the queue. And it, it's all about that threat of, of air attack. Of course, it, it's boosted by fears about the expansion of the German Air Force. Uh, and this is another very, very complicated area um, of which there's still a great deal of historical debate. Um, I think the best thing to say here is that uh, at first, I think perhaps the government is complacent. I think there, there is something to the charge of a, a, a bit of complacency uh, in perhaps 1934, 1935. At the same time, Churchill's claims or, or figures about um, German air, air Force expansion are, are taking the worst scenario, uh, the worst projection. Um, and in, in March 1935, Hitler tells the British Foreign Secretary, um, who's then uh, still Sir John Simon, that Germany has achieved equal strength in the, in the air with Britain, which is something that Baldwin had previously pledged in Parliament that, that the government would, would avoid happening. It's pretty clear that it was actually a false claim. It was an exaggeration. It was Hitler boasting, but also using it as a way of getting concessions, that at that point it wasn't true. Uh, but it, it, it does become true uh, over the following years. And by the time we get to the outbreak of war in 1939, the Luftwaffe is uh, significantly larger uh, than the Royal Air Force alone in terms of fighters and bombers. It's not larger than the British and French air forces. And Britain is always expecting that any war with Germany, it will be in alliance with France. It will be Britain and France uh, together. And, and it is true that um, in uh, 1940, um, before the collapse of France, uh, it is still the case that the British and French air forces are not by much, but are larger than the Luftwaffe, uh, and their land forces are larger than the than the German army. They have more tanks, but the way they use them and the way they spread them out, and the tactical doctrines. Um, are, are not are different and are not as effective as it turns out that the German ones are. The other thing we might mention here is, um, I think, quite a significant success for the policy of appeasement uh, and the attempt to get agreements on armaments. In the summer of 1935, Britain negotiates an agreement on naval arms with, with Germany, with with Hitler, uh, which holds the German Navy to a very small proportion of the British surface fleet. Um, it avoids a naval race with Germany. Uh, it, uh, in the Anglo-German naval agreement, the German surface fleet is to be no more than 35% of the size of the, the Royal Navy. Uh, Germany is allowed to uh, have the same number of submarines as the Royal Navy. And you might think, well, that's odd, given the, the U-boat war of the First World War. But the Royal Navy doesn't actually have a lot of submarines at this time. And in any case, submarines are actually something that can be built uh, very quickly. Um, they're, you know, comparatively light craft. They are, they're not like building a battleship or, or, or an aircraft carrier. Um, it's perhaps significant here to say that when war breaks out, 
Germany only has 57 submarines. It builds 1,162 from the outbreak of war through to the last ones brought into service before the end. The, the U-boat fleet that is so perilous in the Battle of the Atlantic in 1941, 42, 43, are all U-boats built after the after the outbreak of war? Almost, almost all U-boats built after the outbreak of of the war. The naval agreement, which Hitler pretty much sticks to, he does repudiate it in 1939 before the war begins, but it holds German naval building back. The German navy, on the surface, the the German surface fleet in the Second World War, can never threaten British control of the seas. The most it can do is be a brief commerce raider before either being sunk or having to scuttle back into, into, into harbour. So it's kind of, well, it's it, as with a lot of things, really, it's a kind of mixed picture, isn't it? There's successes and failures. And I mean, you couldn't really assess any government that doesn't have those. Um, mm -hmm. If we take it in the round, then, the national government, um, and particularly really Macdonald and Baldwin are the, are the dominating figures of not just the national governments, but the whole interwar era. Um, now today they are very much forgotten figures. They are to some extent, particularly with Macdonald, disowned by their own parties, you know, um, but, you know, Macdonald remains a kind of bogeyman in labor circles. But I also couldn't really imagine, you might correct me here, Stuart, but I couldn't really imagine a modern conservative MP ever naming Baldwin as their, as their favourite leader or, or prime minister. Um, now, these are men that dominated an entire era of British political history. They, I think it's interesting to note, um, served as prime minister, resided in number 10 longer than Lloyd George, than Attlee, than Macmillan, men who have probably superior reputations today. Um, why do you think they're forgotten? Why do you think they're disowned, even though they guided Britain out of the Great Depression and their governments, or the national government at least, is record, as we've discussed today, is probably seriously underrated? Yes, particularly in the case of Ramsay MacDonald. Um, there's no successor party to look back to him as an influence or uh, someone to cite as an example. Um, national Labour basically fades away in the course of the Second World War and just after um, any remaining of its figures uh, who are still politically active are basically absorbed into the Conservative Party. Similar thing happens to the Sir John Simon, the Simonite wing of the Liberal Party, who formally merged with the Liberal Party in, in an agreement in, in 1947. So in MacDonald's case, uh, people are looking back to perhaps understandably, particularly his last year or so as Prime Minister, um, and seeing him really from, 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 from that perspective. He's obviously still a, a person regarded very negatively by many in the in the Labour Party. Um, although some of the heat of, of, of that, I think, has has you know gone out uh, with the passage of time, and there is perhaps, I think, nowadays probably more recognition um, it, within even within the Labour Party of Macdonald's really important role in the emergence of the Labour Party. His really important role from the 1890s right through to, um, you know, the formation of the first Labour, late, late Labour government. So Macdonald's reputation perhaps in that respect has, has gone up, but his reputation in the 1930s, not, not so much. In the case of Baldwin, there are quite a few Conservatives who look back to his um, kind of moderate, um, broad appeal, the way that he appealed to uh, the, the, the public very widely um, as something that uh, is uh, an interesting example to follow. Um, there was some suggestion that 
um, particularly in the 1980s, that John Major was interested in trying to recreate a kind of sort of Baldwinian conservatism um, to, to have a ha, ha, have a wide appeal. Um, so there are there are, I think, more conservatives who would look back to Baldwin um, as one of the more significant conservative leaders not so much for specific legislation or achievements, more in two respects for his style of conservatism, for, for his principles, if you, if you like, um, and for the way in which his approach to constitutional issues made interwar Britain more stable politically, um, certainly compared to many other, many other countries and many European countries. So I think there's a, a recognition of the significance of Baldwin's contribution to what you might call the political atmosphere, the, the, the political culture of the country um, and to, to political stability and to a kind of middle of the road conservatism that had a very broad uh, public appeal. And I think one thing that um, kind of speaks to the dominating presence of the era is the fact that they are two of a pretty small club of, of prime ministers who get to leave at a time of their own choosing. You know, they're not booted out by their party or by the public. Um, so, you know, they, they no, totally didn't get on that true. badly. That's true. I suppose you, I suppose you could say, in in both their cases, more definitely McDonald's, that their resignations come about quite largely because of health grounds and 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 health problems. But yes, Baldwin certainly does does uh, leave at a, at a moment of his own choosing. It's it's not a collapse of health of the kind that, for example, affected Anthony Eden or or indeed. Harold Macmillan's decision to to resign in 1963. Um, that's true in the case of both Macdonald and, and, and Baldwin. But in Baldwin's case, ironically, as you say, one of the very few prime ministers to depart, not really because of any great pressure to do so. He leaves the premiership to enormous uh, public uh, acclaim and, and approval, probably more so I find it hard to think of any other prime minister who, at the moment that they left office, were as popular, as widely admired, even across, um, you know, a wider political spectrum than their own party. And yet, within three, four years, by the middle of the Second World War over, his reputation is just about the lowest of any prime minister with, with, with public opinion. And it's only slowly really recovering um, in, in, in the last few decades. And not a, not a small amount of that, I think, has to do with Winston Churchill, not just his kind of heroic reputation and the fact he comes after these national government leaders and therefore is something seen as better, but the fact that he writes um, the history in the immediate post-war years that very explicitly condemns these figures like Macdonald and Baldwin. And of course, they are the very people who stymied his career in the 30s. So yes, I think that's yeah. probably part of it, it. it. It's it's quite a partisan view and, of course, carried enormous weight with, with public opinion. And I think, really, we would often describe the um, view of the national governments of, of the interwar period more broadly and of figures like Baldwin and, and Macdonald, but especially of the, 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 the national governments in the 1930s, the, the very, very negative, very critical view of them that was held from the 1940s to the 1970s as the Churchillian orthodoxy. Um, and it, it has come much more into question, especially the point that you've raised several times, Alex, quite, quite rightly in, in this discussion of what credible, viable alternative was there? Yes, at certain points, at various points, Churchill is 
proposing um, other courses of action, but what they would have led to and whether they would have actually been effective or whether they would have been possibly even more disastrous is, is very much of an open question. Obviously, it wasn't an open question after Churchill's heroic wartime leadership. Uh, it wasn't an open question at all. He was obviously he was obviously completely right and they were obviously completely wrong. But when you go back to it and look at it more closely, you find Churchill's criticisms at the time were less explicit, were, were often less strong, and his proposals of what should be done instead uh, are often not really practicable, certainly not in terms of what Britain either could do, but most of all, of what British public opinion would do. I'll just offer you uh, a parallel that might be very controversial, that might be very controversial. But let's think of the Munich crisis, where many people, uh, certainly in the decades after the Second World War, suggested that Britain, this is where Britain really failed, and Britain should have, you know, gone to war uh, to prevent uh, German um, uh, against Germany at the, at the time of the, uh, the Czech crisis in, in 1938. And if you think of the state of public opinion at that time and what it, as I've said, it fears the next war is going to be like. So to go to war over the Czech crisis in the autumn of 1938, would be for Britain to engage in a massive war, land, sea, and air against a huge, Euro powerful European power in order to prevent the German ethnic and German speaking districts on the borders of Czechoslovakia that claim to have been oppressed and want to join the German state on the principle of national self-determination, that Britain should fight this war to prevent the Sudeten German districts of Czechoslovakia merging with Germany. Do you think, or does that, do we think, that when Vladimir Putin annexed the Ukrainian area of the Crimea a few years ago, British public opinion would have backed war with Russia, including an exchange of nuclear missiles, in order to prevent Putin's Russia taking a disputed region populated partly by Russian population and the existing base of the Russian fleet in the Black Sea um, away from Ukraine. I don't think British public opinion would have backed a war for a far away place of which we know little then any more than it would in 1938. It's a very good point and it hammers home that that key point about 1939 about the British public accepting it had to be war and that everything had been done for peace. Um, and yes, the, the kind of justification of, of a huge global struggle, it matters, doesn't it? It matters. Mm -hmm. Particularly in, after the First World War when so many people thought it, it, it shouldn't have done, that it, it wasn't a good enough cause for war. It's an excellent point and a really, th you know, thought-provoking one to end on. Um, well, thank you so much, Stuart, for both this episode and the previous one, taking us through so many crucial events in Britain's history in the 1930s. Thank you, Stuart. Not at all. And thank you for bearing with it and all its various complications and byways and highways. Thank you very much. Peter. All right, well... Thank you for joining us for this two-part episode and look forward to the next episode. I've been Peter. And I've been Alex. And thanks for listening to History's Most. Mm -hmm.